The Sacrilege is one of the few Amar ships that I actively enjoy flying and choose to fly whenever I can. First of all, it uses the Mala hull, and yes it is pronounced Mala, a hull that I think looks absolutely stunning, but it replaces that ostentatious golden bone colour scheme with a much more magnificent black and silver number. In addition to that, this thing no longer uses high-powered disco lights and instead is launching high-velocity missiles. Nothing quite like launching a ton of hot explosive lead at your opponent and watching those new beautiful explosions from the Viridian expansion. Now this is a very popular Carnage ship, both for PvE and PvP, and in this video I'll be undocking this, taking this into some fairly high level Abyssal Dead Spaces and showing you how you can use this to make a good deal of ISK. Ahoy there folks, I'm Captain Benzi and welcome to another video for EVE Online. In this video I'm going to be showcasing the Amar Empire Sacrilege, or I suppose more correctly the Carnid Kingdom Sacrilege. Now they are technically part of the Amar Empire, but they do away with most of the things that I don't enjoy about Amar ships. Instead of running high power flashlights called lasers, we're running missiles, which are one of my favoured weapon systems, and we get rid of that horrific ostentatiousness of the gold and bone colour scheme and instead replace it with this much more handsome black and silver. We don't need a skin for this to make it look really cool and less like a floating cathedral and you know what, I'm cool with that. Even the name, Sacrilege, whereas most of the Amar ships are named after these quasi-religious dogmatic naming conventions, Sacrilege almost seems to fly in the face of that. A Sacrilege is something that is kind of against religion, and as a Minmatar pilot, the concept of flying something sacrilegious to the Amar faith well, that feels kind of cool, you know? So, what I'm going to be showcasing in today's video is taking this out into fierce abyssal dead spaces, and with the right skills, with the right implants, you can even take this up to raging, and that's just so, so, so cool. Anyway, if you do enjoy this video, please take that brief second to hit like and maybe drop a comment down below about how you feel about this ship, about the fit. Maybe you think I'm completely wrong about calling the Amar Empire God-fearing laser monkeys, but hey, let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments. It really does help my videos. It increases their reach um, and gets them out to more viewers. If you do want to go the extra mile though to help support my channel and keep me making content like this, you can do so by heading to my Patreon page, my Redbubble merchandise store, or indeed my PayPal. Patreon page as well. Now, I've already said Patreon, it's the PayPal tip jar that I forgot to mention. Anyway, beyond that as well, if you are new to EVE Online, if you're looking at this as a ship that you would like to fly in the future, I can get you 1 million free skill points by clicking my referral link down below. There is a slight kickback for me as well, but hey, it's the million free skill points for you that I'm, you know, mostly interested in. If you are interested in getting some more help and advice as well outside of my videos and content, you can find me and the Catskull Corporation on Discord. There's a bunch of friendly folks there who are more than happy to talk all things EVE Online, there's even a dedicated Abyssal Dead Space channel where you can talk about modifying your fits and what different ships can run different types of content. Anyway, with all of that said and done then, let's jump right into talking about the Carnid Kingdom Sacrilege running Abyssal Dead Spaces. Now normally at this point in one of my Abyssal Dead Space videos, I would briefly pause to talk about what an Abyssal Dead Space is, how to run it, and kind of why you would want to. But I'm kind of thinking that if you're running something like a Sacrilege, a heavy assault cruiser, you've probably run a few Abyssals already. But a brief word of warning for those who are watching this thinking, this is a really cool ship, I'd like to see what it can do. If you are wanting to run this in an Abyssal Dead Space, try a different ship first. Try something a little bit cheaper, heck, even a standard Mala is going to do really well in Abyssal Dead Spaces like Tier 1s, um, and come join the Catskull Discord, talk in the Abyssal Dead Space chat there to get a feel for what that content's like. I do also have an Abyssal Dead Space playlist on my channel that you can run through, and that will teach you what Abyssal Dead Spaces are and show you some really good starting points. This is an excellent ship for it, but it's worth getting a feel for the content before risking a 255 million isk ship in it. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's talk about the Sacrilege itself. 
Now, as I've mentioned, the Sacrilege is a heavy assault cruiser for the Amar Empire, built and designed by the Carnid Kingdom. This means we are going to get bonuses from Amar Cruiser and from heavy assault cruisers. Now, those two skills are going to be, obviously, need to be trained. Now, Amar Cruiser, you're going to need to get to five anyway. There's no running this at Amar Cruiser 4. In order to train into this and fly it, you do need Amar Cruiser 5. We then have the Heavy Assault Cruiser skill. I recommend getting that up to four before trying this in a run. Anything lower than four and you might struggle. You probably can still get away with the fierce, but the raging are going to be out of reach unless you're running heavy assault cruiser four or preferably even five at that point. Anyway, let's look at the bonuses. So first of all, as a heavy assault cruiser, we have a roll bonus to fit assault damage controls. So let's spend a brief moment talking about what this module is. Now, hopefully by this point in the game, you're already familiar with what a damage control unit is, but if you're not, it's a low slot module that increases your hull, shield, and armor resistances across the board. You get a boost to all of those. Yes, it can theoretically be better to fit, say, a multi-spectrum shield hardener rather than a damage control unit, but they use different slots and so on and so forth, and this does apply to everything. Now, an assault damage control has slightly lower base stats than a standard damage control unit. Its passive stats aren't quite as good. You can see at the bottom here, we get a 25% increase to all our hull resistances, a 7.5% increase to our armor damage resistances, and only a 5% increase to our shield damage resistances. Now, you might be thinking, well, why on earth would I want to fit this when I could just go with a standard damage control unit? And it's because these ones have activatable modes. You can activate one of these. And what that will do is increase all of those damage resistances to 75%. And I'll showcase that in action in just a moment when we simulate this fit. It's worth noting it does this for about eight to nine seconds. It does have a long cooldown. 150 seconds must elapse between the end of the activation and the start of the next one. So this is kind of an oh crap button that you can press to take minimal damage for an eight to nine second duration. It is pretty much a get out of jail free card and it makes the heavy assault cruisers very powerful. It's notable you can also fit them to assault frigates and if you mouse over this it'll tell you what those all are so you can look down that list and get a feel for different ships that also use that module. Can only be put on assault frigates or heavy assault cruisers, cannot be put on anything other than those. Anyway, that is an assault damage control and we have the ability to fit those thanks to this roll bonus. Now the Amar Cruiser skill, which remember you're going to have to have trained to 5, is going to give you a 5%, or I may as well just give the full bonus because you're going to need to have Amar Cruiser 5. At Amar Cruiser 5 you'll have a 25% bonus to heavy missile and heavy assault missile damage. Note that does not apply to rapid light missiles, that is only to heavy and heavy assault, and a 25% bonus to all armor resistances. So we're getting some nice armor resistance bonuses already before the assault damage control is fitted or activated, and we're getting some pretty nice damage buffs there to heavy and heavy assault missiles. Now the heavy assault cruiser skill, training into that, is going to give us per level 7.5% bonus to heavy missile and heavy assault missile maximum velocity, that's additional range, and a 5% bonus to rapid light missile, heavy missile, and heavy assault missile launcher rate of fire. So if you did want to fit rapid lights to this, you are going to get a, a rate of fire bonus here, but you're not getting this damage bonus. As such, you can kind of look at the sacrilege as theoretically possible to be fit with rapid lights, and I'm sure there are some pretty good fits that do utilize rapid lights, but for the most part we're going to be focusing on either heavy missiles or heavy assault missiles in order to get both the damage bonus and the rate of fire, attacking the DPS equation from both sides. Remember DPS, damage per second. You can increase your DPS by increasing your rate of fire or increasing the damage of each shot. And if you're trained into both a Mar Cruiser and heavy assault cruisers, you're getting both. That's really, really powerful. We do also have the ability to fit drones in this, and they're not terrible. They add a nice little bit of extra firepower to this fit, as we'll see in a moment. So all of that said, let's talk about that fit in general. Now, as usual, I will put the link to this fit in the description down below, so you can load that into either Pypher, or you can load it into the game and see how this all works with your skills. I'm not gonna do a full skill plan for this ship. Again, if you're flying something like a heavy assault cruiser, you should have a vague understanding of how to skill your ship. 
Now, looking at the power grid and the CPU, you are going to want to have power grid and CPU management skills trained up fairly high. You're also going to want to have things like your weapon upgrade skill trained, because that will reduce the power grid requirement of your weapons and allow you to fit accordingly. Now, if you are struggling to fit this, of course, some of the modules can be swapped down to things like compacts. We'll talk about that as we go through the fit. This is the fit I recommend, but of course you can tweak this and change it to your heart's desire, and I would love to hear what you guys come up with in the comments. So starting with the high slots then, we've already talked about it, but we're going to be using heavy assault missile launches. I love hams. These are probably one of my favorite weapon systems in the game. They do great damage. They have all right range to them and just uh, there's something about them. This was the first weapon system that I properly trained into and got the specialization all the way up. Anyway, a heavy assault missile launcher twos. I do recommend those because it is nice to be able to use the tech two ammo. But as you can see, I do actually only have Kaldari Navy Inferno heavy assault missiles launched in this at the moment, so you theoretically could get away with something like arbalests if you lack the skills to fit the launcher twos, or if you just want to reduce some of your cost a little bit. Ultimately, I really like this weapon system. You can see there we've got a flight range of 25 kilometers from these, which should be plenty for everything we're going to be going up against. Great DPS per module of 81.4 DPS, 220 hit points of thermal damage every launch with these. And you can kind of just carry a load of Kaldari Navy swapping between Inferno, Mjolnir, Nova and Scourge depending on what you're going up against. For the final high slot, we've got a utility left. I've gone for a medium nave scoped energy Nosferatu. This essentially allows us to drain capacitor from enemies whilst we're in there. For the most part, we're pretty cap stable on this fit anyway, but what else are you gonna do with that high slot? And simply put, there are some ships in there that can do some heavy neutralization a uh, go. It, to me, at least, it feels worthwhile having something that just helps us with that stability a little bit more. While they're neutralizing us, we can just be draining a bit of that back from the rats in order to keep our capacitor as stable as possible. For the mid slots, this is a cruiser. We want a bit of extra speed. 10 mega newton afterburner two, nice and simple. This is probably the one that you would probably go down to a compact first if you really needed that extra fitting room because there's not such a huge drop between a 10 mega newton afterburner two and a standard 10 mega newton compact afterburner. It's probably the one you'd look at going into first. Then we've got two Stasis Web of Fire 2s. These mean that any frigate within 10 kilometers or any other ship within 10 kilometers, we can web. You can put two webs on one ship, you can put one web on two separate ships. It's gonna reduce the target's maximum velocity by a whopping 60%, which increases the amount of damage application going on with those heavy assault missiles. It's entirely up to you how you split those. I tend to put them both on the same target just to kill it as quickly as possible, but I know some people do like to put them on multiple targets because the application difference is minor. Um, and it means that you don't have to wait for one of them to stop activating to apply it to a new target. You've already got your second target webbed and held in position. Remember how webs work is to reduce the current velocity by 60%. So if a ship has, say, a thousand meters per second, the first web will drop that from a thousand down to 400. Then the second web will drop that 400 by a further 60%, give or take a stacking bonus. But, you know, for the purposes of just brief calculations, you're going to drop the 400 um, meters per second down a further 60% from there. It's not, not going to drop by 120%. It's multiplicative, not additive. Finally, for the mid slots then, a Republic Fleet large cap battery helps us maintain really nice capacitor stability. You can see up here that we are cap stable at 67%. We have a delta of 22.4 gigajoules per second, 40.6%, really nice, really comfortable. If we are getting muted, we have that Nosferatu to help us out. For the low slots then, of course, the Assault Damage Control 2 is put in there. If you're going to fl fly a heavy assault cruiser, I kind of feel like the Assault Damage Control is pretty much an auto-include. I know people will disagree with me on that, and I do understand that there are other modules that could go in there instead, but for me, that ability to just go, oh damn, I'm taking too much damage, let's just pop that for a second, can be absolutely vital. Like, if you're trying to approach something like a Charybdis, and you've screwed up your approach, or you're having trouble with some of the devoted rooms and things like that, then this is a great option just to reduce your incoming damage for those eight, nine seconds as you close the gap, and start to reduce that incoming damage, whether that's via traversal or by killing the ever-living crap out of whatever's shooting at you. 
For the rest of survivability, I've gone for a multi-spectrum energized membrane too, but you could also go for a reactive. I like reactives for C3 wormholing content, not so much for abyssals, because there are some rooms where the reactive just doesn't work as well. There are some rooms where it works better. That said, because of the random nature of an abyssal dead space, I try to balance that out, and I just, rather than have something that's good in some rooms and bad in others, I'd rather go for something that's just above good, you know, rather than great in some rooms and crap in others, something that is just good all round. To me, that makes more sense because it is entirely possible to get a run where all three rooms are just crap for your reactive ar armor hardener, and that's going to cause problems. So go for the multi-spectrum energized membrane. That's my thoughts, at least. For the rest of the tank then, two medium armor, a pair of twos. For the most part, we're only gonna to need to run one of those. There are gonna be times when having the second one is gonna help keep us alive. Again, try to use the two armor repairers together first before popping that assault damage control. Only pop the assault damage control when you really need it because that 150 second timer, that cooldown on it is notable, especially in an abyssal dead space where your entire run is timed. Final thing then, Ballistic Control System 2, just to increase the amount of DPS we're doing. We are doing a respectable 549.6 DPS. 550 DPS is a decent amount. Now, admittedly, 142.5 of that is from the drones, but that's still a good amount of damage. For the rigs, first rig is a medium auxiliary nano pump in order to help those armor repairers do their thing, followed by a bay loading accelerator too, just to keep that DPS up as high as possible by launching as many missiles out into space as we can manage. And that's it. That is basically the fit. But let's simulate that just to showcase the assault damage unit in action, because when we simulate, it's with every module on. And oh boy, would you look at those resistances. Even the shield becomes heavily resistant. 75% is our lowest resistance, up to 97 on explosive. And it's even better on armor. And of course, this is an armor tank. 98% explosive at the top end, 91% on thermal. That's just insanely good. And means you're going to take almost no damage at all for the duration of that assault damage control unit. Anyway, with all of that said and done then, let's showcase this in action. Now here I'm going to run a fierce dark abyssal dead space. I'm going to showcase this in the fierce because I'm using a clean clone at the moment. And if you want to go into the raging, you are going to need to have a clone that has some missile and tank based implants in order to help you out. Now, as usual, I'm going to be showcasing this fit. And I'm going to say, as I always do, I am not the best pilot in this game by a long shot. I'm going to make a lot of mistakes throughout this. I'm going to fly in a very basic manner. So if you are someone who is going to be flying this more dedicatedly, you're going to do this better than I do. So don't go into the comment section saying, oh my god, you fly it like an idiot. I know. So we're coming into the first room here. This is a Triglavian room. We've got a striking Damovic, striking Kiki Mora's, um, a renewing Rediva. There's a lot of ships in here that we're gonna need to take out. And so basically I'm gonna go after that Rediva first of all, because a Rediva is a remote repair ship. If I leave that alive, every time I shoot at something else, that Rediva is going to start to repair it. So I wanna get rid of that first of all, so that we can just not worry about having everything healing whilst I'm shooting at it. And I've got fairly decent range on the missiles that I'm running here, so I'm going to start to move towards the bioadaptive cache and start to orbit that. Obviously, manual piloting in an abyss is a great way to do it because it means you can constantly be keeping the exact range that you are looking for. You'll also notice I'm, of course, using Inferno missiles for that thermal damage because we are in a firestorm filament. I've got my drones out. I'm launching those at different things as well. I am well aware that there's a lot of ships yellow boxing there, but my drones don't seem to be taking damage yet. I'm going to pull them back because I don't want to keep that risking. Um, but they are a fairly decent amount of DPS from this fit. Obviously, when it comes to it, a lot of these ships that we're flying up against don't have the best tracking, so they're not hyper aggressive against the drones. They're not a huge problem. But there we are. There goes the Rediva. We're now going to move on to the ghosting Kiki Mora. Now you'll notice that these different ships have different names and that can refer to what they do. And a ghosting Kikimura um, applies both a tracking disruptor and a guidance disruptor. Now the tracking disruptor doesn't affect me at all, but the guidance disruptor absolutely does. That's going to be reducing my application on targets. And it means that things are gonna take longer to kill because I'm not able to apply as much damage as I normally would. 
So you can see here, it's taking a little bit of time to get through this one because I am losing a lot of my application against these. Um, obviously this is in a dark as well, so we've got the advantages and disadvantages of that right now. I'm flying through one of the orange clouds. Should, should really be manually piloting this away and maybe heading back towards the gate or even the biocombinative. I should maybe send the drones after that or whatever. It's taking a bit of time. As I said, I'm not flying this particularly efficiently, but in my defense, that really showcases that actually this is a solid fit because if you fly it and you're not an idiot, you're gonna do better than I am. And if I can do this, then you most definitely can. That's kind of the running theme of my EVE Online content, right? Anyway, that ghost in Kikimura is about to go down. At this point, every enemy up against us is just striking. Striking Damovic, striking Kikimura. Striking is just DPS. And remember, these are Triglavian ships. They are using entropic disintegrators. And if you don't know how an entropic disintegrator works, in short, as long as it is targeting the same thing, it starts to spool up and its DPS increases. So the longer that one ship is shooting at you, doesn't even have to be hitting, but the longer that a ship is shooting at you, the more DPS it gets and the higher its damage is going to go. This means that these rooms can actually be kind of scary because you've got a lot of these ships to clear through and the ones that you get to last are going to have spooled all the way up to dealing some really quite frightening DPS. That's why we need a lot of tank. You see, I've got both of the armor repairers running at the moment. I do have the Nosferatu going as well. I should be pretty cap stable. Nothing's neuting me but I'd rather have that Nosferatu going to keep my capacitor as high as possible so that I can quickly move into the next room and if something there starts newting me, it's newting me from say 90% rather than newting me from 60%. Hopefully that makes sense. Anyway, at this point, it's pretty much just orbit the Damovix, maybe move towards that biocombative cache um, and start to kill everything. I am gonna skip ahead because this is a long run and yeah, this room is now just basically shoot everything. There's nothing else to do, just orbit and shoot. Moving now then into the second room. Let's see what we come up against. We're about a third of the way through the timer on this. Again, I do strongly recommend um, when you're going into sort of abyssals at this kind of level that you are running a clone with implants because it'll just help you go that little bit faster through this. And we've got another uh, another Triglavian room. I've accidentally locked onto the transfer conduit, which I should probably delock, but we've got starving Vedmax, ghosting Damovix, harrowing Vedmax, a lot of stuff going on here. Remember those ghost Ghosting are going to be hitting us with tracking disruptors and guidance disruptors. And the fact that there's two of them, well, that's not fun at all. That's actually going to cause some real problems for application. But fortunately, the standard VEDMAX are pretty fragile. We should be able to just punch through those even with lower application. Ideally, you probably want to go for the ghosting first of all on these, but those starvings do do neutralization. So I'd want to get at least one of those down as quickly as possible, just to keep myself as capacitor stable as possible. You could theoretically go for a ghosting first. I just like to go for the starving to keep myself capacitor stable. Cause at the moment, as I said, I've got two newts on me. I would just rather that be one newt. It's also worth noting that looking at my drones, you may have noticed I completely failed to bring them back in time. A lot of you have commented in the comment section saying, your drone control is absolutely awful, Benzie. And yeah, it is. Yeah, it, it really, really is. Like I know how to do drone control. I'm just terrible at actually doing it. At this point as well, I really should have everything on the starving VEDMAC rather than sort of splitting it between the two. But because I've got some, I've got like, you know, my missiles shooting, the hams shooting at the starving VEDMAC, but the harrowing is taking my drones. I'm mainly doing this because I just want to see how much my drones do on their own. But I really should have just put everything onto one. At least I think that's why I'm doing this. It's, you know, been a couple of days since I did this run. Obviously, I'm talking over footage that I recorded. And I don't really remember. It might have just been me being an idiot and not even spotting that my drones were on multiple targets rather than just one. But there we are. That is the first one down. Moving on to the harrowing VEDMAC. I'm also just realizing that I'm sitting here saying that you should try and get rid of both, you know, at least one of these because it's got the newts on it and I want to split the newts in half. Yeah, one of them was a starving, the other's harrowing. And the harrowing isn't really doing anything to me right now other than obviously 
shooting. So yeah, we're just going to take that one down. At this point, I really should be going after the ghostings first and foremost, because they are slowing down how long it takes me to hit everything, well, how long it takes me to kill everything else because of those disruptors. So again, kind of... When you're in an abyssal dead space and you're looking at what enemies you're up against, consider the best way to do things. Like getting rid of remote rep ships first and foremost is always a good idea because otherwise it's just going to take you longer to clear anything else. At this point, again, the ghostings follow that same rule. I should be shooting those first because with them alive, it's taking longer to kill that harrowing Vedmac because I have a lower missile application than I normally would. With the harrowing down though, it's time to go after that ghosting and kill that as quickly as possible. We'll then move on to the second ghosting, kill the biocombative clash, and start to make my way towards the gate into room number three. And as you can see, I'm having no issues at all here, so I am just gonna skip ahead to that point. Of course, I say I'm having no issues, that's excluding my usual lag, but that's just life in Zimbabwe for you. Anyway, second room cleared. Oops, forgot to activate the game for some uh, gate for some reason, I just approached it. Let's move into room number three, third and final room. I've still got a third of my time left in here. Should be plenty of time. What do we have? Oh, we've got a rogue drone room. Okay, so we've got a load of different tessellers, and we've got a Bathic Abyssal Overmind. Nice, scary-looking ship there. So, in this room, the first thing we should be looking at here are those Plate Forger tessellers, because as I've said already, Plate Forger are remote reps. So what do I shoot? I go after the Snare Caster, because of course I do. Because webs are important to kill, right? Yeah. No, in this point you should be going after those plate forger to sellers because they are the ones that are going to be repairing up everything else and therefore it's going to take longer to destroy everything else because those plate forges are going to be repairing it. Any damage I do, the plate forger just goes nope and starts to heal it. Go after any remote repair ships first. Again, I repeat, I'm not a good pilot, I make silly mistakes. Whilst we're doing this though, because most of those ships are going to try and stay fairly close to us, I'm going to move towards that Bathic Abyssal Overmind so I can start orbiting that at a close range. Annoyingly, the Plate Forges appear to be keeping their distance a little bit, but it's okay, we've got two of those, let's lock the second one. That Snare Caster is about to go down. Cool, there we are. So yeah, definitely at this point, we should be going after the Plate Forger, but because I want to bring my drones out, I also want to get rid of those Spark Needles. Spark Needles are hyper aggressive to drones, or at least in my experience they are. They do a lot of damage, they aggress drones quickly, so I kind of want to get this one done and dusted as swiftly as I can so that we can move on to everything else. But you can see, no real problems at this point. There's a few enemies, it's going to take me a while to get through these and to chew through everything. Again, I'm watching this footage back and going, Benzie, what were you doing? Plate forges, plate forges, they're right there. Why aren't you shooting the plate forges? And I think it's because I just kind of found myself chewing through everything else quick enough. I didn't feel the need to go after the plate forges. I can only theorize, right? I can only look back on my time in this epistle and think, why was I doing that? And you see the plate forges go down so quickly. So it's like, you really should be shooting those first. No two ways about it, you should be shooting those plate forges first. Look, I almost kill it in one volley, just two shots, two shots to stop it repairing anything else. Oh dear. Anyway, we're orbiting the Bathic Abyssal Overmind, and at this point you can see that it's not doing anything to me. In fact, my shields are actually recharging quite comfortably right now. Um, the shots that it's firing are just missing. I sent my drones there after the bioadaptive cache, just so that essentially once the Abyssal Overmind dies, I can fly straight at that cache, loot it, and get out of the origin conduit. I'm looking at the time it's taken me to clear this run, and essentially, yes, you can do these runs a lot faster a lot faster, especially if you have the cruiser skills, the heavy assault cruiser skill trained to five. That is a significant DPS and increase and thus duration decrease for running one of these sites. Plus, if you take a decent clone in here that has missile application um, and missile damage implants, that kind of thing, it's just all going to go that little bit better, a little bit faster, a little bit quicker. But at this point, you should be able to see I have clearly finished this Abyssal Dead Space within the time limit. My drones are doing their damage. I love that planet in the background. God, Abyssal Dead Spaces are so pretty sometimes. Drones are doing their damage. My uh, heavy assault missiles are doing their thing too. We're going to loot the bioadaptive cache. 
Remember, you can, when you go to loot something, you can either click loot all, or when that message pops up, just hit enter. Enter is the default keybind for loot all when it's on screen, so it's a quicker way of doing it. Anyway, yeah, back to the Abyssal Overmind. It's still in range, so I'm still doing damage to it. You might even want to be overheating at this point if you've got decent thermodynamic skills and you're not an idiot like me that tends to leave overheat running long after you actually need it. Overheating a heavy assault missile and launcher increases its rate of fire and therefore the DPS that you are putting out. So for something like an, a Bathic Abyssal Overmind here, it would allow me to tutor it just that little bit quicker. But again, I'm kind of an idiot at this point. I'm, I'm running a lot of this stuff and I mean, heck, why? Why have I just loaded Nova missiles? I mean, I suppose these do have a lower explosive resistance and so I'm kind of hoping to exploit that, but it's a Firestorm. No, it's not, it's a Dark. I'm running a Dark. So yeah, I should be running Nova. I'm not being an idiot. I'm running a Dark, so it should have been Nova much early on. I'm not an idiot for changing to Nova. I'm an idiot for only changing to Nova now. I should have been doing Nova earlier on in order to punch through this faster. Again, there we go, running Abyssal Dead Spaces. Learn your enemy's resistances, especially when you are flying in darks, because the other four types obviously reduce different resistances. Darks don't. Darks don't reduce resistances, so you do need to know what the resistance holes are for the different enemy types that you are up against. It's going to be a little bit tight, so I'm going to kind of keep talking and showcase that I do manage to get out of here alive, because I know some people will put in the comment section that they doubt it survived, but we've got a couple of minutes left. That Bathic Abyssal Overmind is about to die. I'm kind of looking at things and considering the extractions, but screw it. Pull the drones back, because those missiles are going to finish this off in a couple of volleys, and then we will be able to leave this Abyssal behind us nice and easily. Remember, if you want to do this faster, or if you even want to take this up to raging, just make sure you're using a proper clone with proper skills, and it's more than possible. Anyway, folks, thank you for watching right the way through to the end. Would love to hear your thoughts and opinions in the comment section down below. Otherwise, happy sailing, and see you in New Eden!